40,000 tons of steel plow into the muddy beaches of South Asia, bringing a definitive end to the vessel's operational life. Massive ships, measuring up to 1,000 feet in length, intentionally run aground instead of docking at an equipped port. Hundreds of these floating cities arrive here every year to face destruction, but this is just the beginning. Why choose a remote beach for such a complex industrial operation? At first glance, the grounding appears to be a chaotic accident, but in reality, it is a calculated maneuver to grant access to the hull. The tide retreats, allowing thousands of workers to approach the steel leviathan on foot. One can notice the bright glow of cutting torches that burn at 5,400 degrees Fahrenheit. Laborers dismantle the structure piece by piece, from individual compartments to complex pipelines, for wages of less than $4 a day. The ship is cut apart until it vanishes completely, as if it had never existed. It does not end at this stage. More than 90% of the ship's materials are recovered for recycling. This high efficiency, however, is achieved within a hazardous working environment. The salvaged steel leaves the beach, ready for rebirth in a new form. 100,000 vessels. This number defines the massive scale of the global commercial fleet today. Shipyards launch around 2,700 new units yearly. Why must these steel giants eventually face dismantling? At first glance, a metal hull seems built to last forever. But in reality, a ship operates efficiently for only about 25 to 30 years before economics dictates its end. 400 to 500 older ships leave service annually. Maintenance costs rise relentlessly as saltwater corrosion attacks the steel. Rust eats deep into the plating over decades of sea travel, weakening the hull structure. But this is just the beginning of the structural decline. It is visible how cargo holds and engines eventually fail to maintain original safety standards. Complex machinery systems become outdated against modern requirements. Global emission standards now mandate reduced sulfur content in fuel, making older vessels legally obsolete. Yet, not all ships retire due to age alone. Collisions, groundings, fires, or mechanical failures can strike suddenly. One can observe cases where repair costs exceed the ship's operational value. Dismantling remains the final solution for the vessel's journey. 70% of global shipbreaking activity is concentrated within just three major sites in South Asia. When a vessel finally reaches the end of its life cycle, its destination is likely Along in India, Chittagong in Bangladesh, or Gadani in Pakistan. These locations provide wide coastlines and an enormous demand for scrap steel. But this is just the beginning. Why do these ships head for the beaches instead of specialized facilities? Ideally, one might imagine complex salvage operations at sea involving cranes, robots, and structural simulations. But the economic reality dictates that the ships must be towed straight onto land where labor is cheap. In Along, hundreds of ships are driven directly onto the shoreline every year. One can notice how the hulls stretch along six miles of sand, forming a massive open-air dismantling assembly line. It gets more complex further on. Chittagong utilizes a specific beaching method, forcing ships high onto muddy shores, using the full power of the tides to ground the massive weight. Gadani was once the fastest center in the world, though significant risks accompanied that speed. At first glance, the methods seem chaotic, but in reality, all three yards perform the same critical task. They strip apart tens of thousands of tons of steel from the frames. The material flows back into the global economy, ready for a new purpose. Three to six million United States dollars. Exactly this amount is generated by a typical cargo ship before a single torch is lit. Buyers, typically scrap steel traders or shipbreaking companies, conduct a rigorous assessment of the vessel. They base the value on two critical factors, the tonnage of recoverable steel and the current market price of scrap. 
one can notice that cruise ships command even higher valuations during this phase. Why do these passenger vessels differ so drastically in price? Because they contain large quantities of non-ferrous metals, stainless steel, and expensive interior equipment. But this is just the beginning of the calculation. At first glance, dismantling seems like simple destruction. But in reality, it falls into two categories, breaking for scrap and dismantling for component reuse. Most of the steel, copper, and aluminum are recovered alongside electrical cables. It is visible how propellers, shafts, and machinery systems are extracted from the hull. The process is only gaining momentum. Mechanics carefully remove valuable components, such as engines and navigation equipment. Hydraulic pumps and generators undergo inspection before being resold to smaller vessels or local markets. Thus, before the ship is officially cut into sections, it completes its final economic role. The vessel becomes a source of raw materials for many different industries. The assessment ends, ready for the breaking stage. A team of tugboats takes on the task of towing the vessel into the scrapping yard for the last journey of its life. Why does this critical moment always take place during the few hours of high tide? At first glance, the ocean depth seems constant enough for navigation, but in reality, only the rising seawater lifts the massive hull, creating enough depth for the tugboats to control the direction and thrust. This ensures the ship can slide deep onto the sandy beach without drifting off course or getting stuck offshore. If the calculations are wrong, the entire operation faces major difficulties. One can notice how the ship moves onto the beach under its own momentum when everything goes according to plan. As the tide recedes, the hull settles firmly into the shoreline, exposing the enormous underside that has remained hidden beneath the water for decades. But this is just the beginning of the transformation. From a vehicle of transportation, it becomes a massive material waiting to be dismantled. Hundreds of workers move through every steel compartment to dissect the ship from the inside out. The first stage requires completely emptying the ship's compartments of all loose items. Workers dismantle the interior, removing doors, tables, chairs, and lights. At first glance, this seems like chaotic demolition, but in reality, every item is inspected to determine whether it can be reused or resold. Stainless steel railings and electrical wiring are ripped from the walls alongside ventilation systems. For cruise ships, this work is far more complex due to the sheer volume of amenities. Areas such as theaters, cinemas, gyms, and swimming pools must all be stripped manually. Hundreds of cabins require individual attention from the crews. Many valuable components such as industrial kitchens, sound systems, and air conditioning units are removed intact and sold on the market. It gets more complex further on. The environmental handling team takes over once the interior layers are removed. They pump out residual oil from the tanks and treat sludge, wastewater, and any chemicals remaining in pipelines. This is an extremely critical step in the safety protocol. Even a small amount of flammable gas or uncollected oil can turn the flame of a cutting torch into an ignition source. It is visible how the ship is left with only an empty steel framework after the cleaning process. Workers erect scaffolding and mark the cutting lines on the metal plates. The process is only gaining momentum. 3,000 degrees Celsius is the temperature oxyacetylene torches reach to pierce steel plates nearly three centimeters thick. Cutting the hull is the core task of the entire process. Each completed cut separates a steel section weighing several tons. One can notice how the block is carefully rigged with cables before being dropped onto the sand by gravity. The sound of steel hitting the ground always echoes, signaling that another part of the ship's body has been severed. Tractors drag these large sections deeper into the yard to be cut into smaller pieces. Three teams of workers, including steel cutters, transport crews, and cable recovery teams, work continuously to recover as much material as possible. 
Depending on the size of the ship, this entire stage can last from several months to more than a year. Thus, the vessel fully transitions into raw materials for the next production cycle. 12 to 16 hours a day is the grueling schedule endured by shipbreaking workers on the coast. For this intense physical exhaustion, they earn only about three to four United States dollars per shift. The entire stage of breaking down a single vessel can last from several months to more than a year of continuous labor. The specific duration depends heavily on the size of the ship. But this is just the beginning of the harsh reality. Why does this heavy industry rely more on human labor than advanced machinery? Automation seems safer, yet machines lack the adaptability to navigate the intricate, rusted interiors. Consequently, the work remains dependent on manual effort. This reliance keeps the risk of accidents ever present during operations. At first glance, the process sounds sequential and organized, but in reality, it is extremely dangerous. One can notice how laborers maneuver across slippery surfaces with scarce protective equipment. They face constant threats of heavy falling steel plates and slipping from great heights. Residual oil triggers sudden explosions, while invisible asbestos dust fills the air, capable of causing permanent lung damage. And this is not the limit of the hazards. Access to professional medical care remains severely limited at many of these active yards. Since the late 1960s, nearly 2,000 serious accidents have been officially recorded in the logs. However, the actual number may be much higher, as many migrant workers are not officially documented. International organizations have made efforts to improve conditions, yet change has been slow to materialize. It is visible how the cycle of risk continues despite external pressure. Everything only gets more complicated for the workforce. Outside the yards, the struggle follows the workers home to makeshift housing, lacking clean water and basic sanitation. This physically demanding yet unstable work limits access to education and insurance. Therefore, few opportunities exist for alternative livelihoods. Thus, many workers remain tied to this dangerous occupation for years. 40,000 tons is the weight of steel recovered from a single large cruise ship. A medium-sized cargo ship typically supplies between 10,000 and 25,000 tons. Why has this industry existed for more than half a century? Dismantling is slow and difficult work. The answer lies in the enormous economic value of recycled steel. Workers cut the ship piece by piece, turning every steel plate, pipe, and structural frame into a resource. One can notice how the metal is sorted before being sent to the furnace. The steel is reborn as billets, rebar, and plates used in bridges and roads. But this is just the beginning. At first glance, it seems like simple salvage, but in reality, the process is critical for the environment. Recycling saves up to 70% of the energy compared to producing steel from ore and reduces carbon dioxide emissions. Beyond steel, copper from wiring and aluminum from railings are recovered at high rates. It is visible how workers separate brass from propellers and stainless steel from kitchens. These materials have long service lives, helping to reduce pressure on natural resources. The camera glides over mechanical components like compressors, generators, pumps, and navigation systems. These parts are inspected and resold to local markets instead of being melted down. From a ship that appears to have lost all value, the industry generates millions of United States dollars. The equipment continues its journey in new projects. Zero percent waste is the theoretical goal of the circular economy when dismantling giant vessels. Shipbreaking is often described as a major victory for global recycling efforts. Steel is recovered in massive quantities, resources are conserved, and global emissions are theoretically reduced. At first glance, this looks like a triumph of sustainability. But in reality, the environment often dies somewhere else. 
the price paid at these yards is no longer abstract numbers on a spreadsheet, but poisoned soil, contaminated water, polluted air, and human lives. Why does the beaching method remain so widely used despite the obvious risks? To the observer, it looks like a primitive way to dismantle a modern vessel. But without proper waste treatment systems, driving the ship onto open beaches drastically reduces the operational costs. One can notice how hazardous fluids seep directly into the porous sand as the steel hull is breached. A single ship contains dozens of dangerous substances, from asbestos lining the piping to layers of lead-based paint on the hull. Electronic equipment hides polychlorinated biphenyls, while heavy metals mix with residual oil in the tanks. But this is just the beginning of the toxic list. Even biological waste from cruise ship sanitation systems flows out if not handled with extreme care. These substances seep deep into the coastal soil or flow directly into the sea, causing contamination that persists for decades. Measurements in many areas near shipbreaking yards show that concentrations of heavy metals far exceed permitted safety levels. Fish populations and marine life decline sharply as the water quality deteriorates. Land becomes degraded beyond repair, and local residents face serious, long-term health problems. Thus, the dismantling process concludes, but the ecological footprint remains on the coast. 10 to 15 years is the extended duration required to fully dismantle a single nuclear submarine. Only the United States, Russia, and the United Kingdom possess the technical capability to handle such complex vessels. One can notice how specialized facilities isolate these hulls, far from standard scrapping beaches to prevent contamination. But this is just the beginning of the industry's restrictions. Why are these vessels categorically forbidden from being driven onto a sandy beach? At first glance, cutting metal seems universal, but in reality, the risks are incomparable. Nuclear submarines contain active reactors, volatile fuel rods, and radioactive cooling systems. It is visible that these components demand strict isolation to avoid catastrophe. Because of such severe environmental impacts and safety risks, global protocols are shifting. The Hong Kong Convention of 2009 mandates that recycling be carried out in a safe and environmentally sound manner. However, the regulations will not officially enter into force until 2025. The process is only gaining momentum regarding legal compliance. It is visible how regulatory pressure changes the logistics of disposal. The European Union has issued strict regulations requiring ships flying the EU flag to be dismantled only at specifically approved facilities. This ensures that dangerous components are processed without harming the ecosystem. Hundreds of workers swarm the massive hulls at approved facilities on the sandy shores of South Asia, day and night. These vessels bear the physical marks of years spent crossing oceans and transporting cargo. One can notice how deep layers of salt corrosion define the waterline, but this is just the beginning. Why is the steel cut manually on these open beaches? The sheer scale of the operation suggests the need for heavy automation. However, machinery struggles on shifting sands, so cutters slice through massive plates with gas torches. It is visible how the metal separates under the intense blue flame. At first glance, it looks like chaotic destruction, but in reality, it is a critical recovery process despite the risks and controversy. The dismantled steel transforms into bridges, factories, and industrial zones. Even new ships are sometimes forged from this recycled metal. The material transitions into a silent, durable form for future use.